الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising Allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our evil actions anybody whom Allah leaves to go astray no one can guide and anybody whom Allah guides no one can lead astray and i testify that allah alone is worthy of worship and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and his messenger so my dear sisters and brothers in islam i start with sisters because there's a lot more sisters than brothers <laughs> alhamdulillah um Sometimes I get a bit lost for words and I don't know what to talk about but I think uh, Dr Idris gave me an idea um what I will talk about um um and I w- I want to talk about something I'm asked about a lot and although um it's very easy to find this uh on YouTube uh but maybe I don't know maybe you don't have access to YouTube here I don't know So no problem. So I'm I'm going to talk about um my journey to Islam. Uh I know a lot of a lot of people find this interesting. It's not I I usually refuse to talk about this subject anymore. I say go go on the internet you can find it. So but I think inshallah it will be beneficial. Um so my sisters and brothers let me tell you a little bit about my background where I come from uh in terms of my background. Um I come from a you know you could say a normal middle class or upper middle class uh family and my father um was um a banker um and when when he was when I was 10 years old uh he moved to Egypt in order to set up a branch there of a British bank in Egypt um and I was in a boarding school so just like some of you uh you stay here and you sleep here and you eat here and that's it i the same that my my actually i suppose my school was the uh a catholic equivalent of your school here uh i went to a monastic boarding school so instead of a school run by you know mulvis and molanas i'm not saying that it runs well instead of you know we had priests and you know we had uh, uh that that's our school was run by priests basically um so we although um the main drive of education was not religious it was not a mostly religious school we studied uh, o levels and a levels like other schools but we had a lot more emphasis on religion than uh, nearly any other school maybe uh, so from that point of view we did have quite a strong religious uh, education Now I remember when I was very young. Uh and this is before I had gone to school. My mother, now my mother, my father is English, his background is English, but my mother is actually Polish. Um and and she she is the one who is Catholic. My father did not have alhamdulillah until he died. He took shahada, he died Muslim alhamdulillah. But before that he didn't really have any religion. He didn't used to call himself by any religion he would call himself an agnostic an agnostic means i don't know maybe there's a god maybe there's not a god i don't really know as uh, uh, as opposed to an atheist an atheist is someone says i believe there is no god so an atheist believes god does not exist an agnostic says i don't know maybe there is a god maybe not i just don't know so this was my father this my mother even my mother was not very religious uh herself but she was very very determined to send me and my brother to this you know monastic school so that's my you know that's my upbringing now before i went to this school my mother 
was teaching me a prayer. This prayer is, well, this is the, the, you could say, the second main prayer of the Catholic. The first main prayer they have is called uh, the Lord's Prayer. And the second main prayer of the Catholics, this is not all the other Christians, but the Catholics, is a prayer they call Hail Mary. This is a prayer to Miriam. So they're actually praying to her. Hail, and this is how the prayer goes. Hail Mary, Mother of God. Hail Mary, Mother of God. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. This is how the prayer goes. So I remember, as a small kid, my, when my mother said, so say after me, Anthony. That was, that's, that was my name, yeah. Still is my name on my passport. You can see still Anthony. Okay. So she said, say after me, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Mother of God. So when she said Mother of God, I remember thinking, Mother of God? What? What do you mean Mother of God? I didn't say this to her, but in my head I'm thinking, what is that? What Mother of God? How can God have a mother? I was so confused. How can God have a mother? God's supposed to be the one who created everything. I Even as a small kid, I knew this. I was saying, how can God have a mummy? <laughs> I'm trying to imagine, you know, God, you know, maybe having his nappy changed or, you know. I'm so confused, you know, I'm so confused. So I'm trying so hard. You know, when you are young, of course, and maybe even when you're older, you... you you know, you think your mother is the source of all knowledge. That what comes of out of her mouth is complete truth. That this is how it is with the mother. I mean, I learned so much from my mother. So the idea that my mother may be saying something that was not true didn't cross my mind. If my mother said it, it must be true. Therefore, I had to try and understand it in my mind. So I, in, after thinking, you know, in a kid's way, I decided that if, if Mary was the mother of God, she must actually be a bigger God than God. Because if she gave birth to God, she must be a bigger God than God. So I thought, okay, fine. That's that. I didn't think about it anymore. But this was actually my first sort of shock as, um, you know, learning about Christianity. But to be honest, uh, I kept on being shocked. My mind kept on being put into, you know, being confronted with things that didn't make any sense to me. And Christianity seemed to have a lot of things that didn't make any sense. Whether, whether it was the idea that Mary is the mother of God or the concept of the Trinity, that you have God the Father, He is God, and then you have God the Son, and he is God, and you have God the Holy Ghost. But there are not three gods, there is one God. So this is their belief. And I won't go into it more and more. Because the more you talk, the more you say it, the, more, the less sense it makes. Actually, a very good way to give a Christian dawah is say, please explain to me the Trinity. And let them talk and talk and talk. And, and the more they talk, the more. And then they will say, it's very confusing, you just have to believe it. They, they will say it themselves, okay? So this is the Trinity. Then another thing that is specific to the Catholics is something called confession. It's something called confession. Now, as a Catholic, you are supposed to at least, I don't remember, I think at least now they say they change it all the time, but now it's once a year. At least once a year. You're supposed to go every week. But at least you have to go once a year. And you go, you go like they have, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but they have like a cubicle, two, two small rooms. The priest is sitting in one chair. Like, okay, so like this. The priest is sitting in one chair and you sit on another chair. But you can't see the priest. It's, it's divided, yeah? But he can hear you. So then you will sit and you will say to the priest, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Now, you're not saying this to God. You're saying this to the priest. And the priest will say, 
What are your sins, my child? Right? And then you will have to tell the father all of your sins. And the priest used to tell us, you have to tell us everything. If you leave anything out, your sins will not be forgiven. You have to say everything. <laughs> now, you know, when you're a 15, 16-year-old boy in England, you've got a lot of sins, believe me, right? <laughs> you know? and, and believe me, when the guy sitting there is your housemaster, you're not going to tell him all your sins. I, you know, um, Father, I was supposed to write a hundred lines, but I only wrote 99 for the punishment. And, you know, I took one sweet from Johnny, you know, and, and uh, I think I lied a few times as well, and I was not nice to, okay. Well, you know, uh, he said, now what you have to do is say this prayer and say these prayers, and that will be your penance. You know, you'll never tell him the real things you're doing, because uh, he's your housemaster, right? I, I sort of began to think this was some type of ancient spy system so that, you know, the church could keep control of people, which maybe actually that's exactly what it is, right? But the thing that I didn't understand, and I used to ask the priests, I said, explain to me why I have to come and ask you to forgive my sins. Why can't I just ask God? Why do I have to ask you? They would say, no, you can ask God if you want. But the problem is, you can't be sure that God will listen to you. That's what they will say. If you want to be sure that God will listen to you, you have to come through us. Now, the reason I asked this question in the first place is because we lived with the priests and we knew that they were not any better than us. Maybe even some of them were worse than us. In fact, some of them were big hypocrites. So why am I going to ask you? Why, what gives you the authority to say my sins are forgiven when I can't just ask God myself? These are the type of things and many other things, to be honest, that was confusing me about Christianity. But what I want to tell you, sisters and brothers, is that although Christianity was my religion, as we normally understand religion, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, right? I want you to think about what is religion really? And if we think about the, the, if we think about the, the, the use of the word deen, we think of deen being religion. But because our minds have become very secularized, we tend to, even religious people, tend to think in a secular way. We, 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 you know, for example, we talk about our religious education and our secular education. See, even our, the way we talk and the way we discuss about religion, it's as if religion is something separate and different from life. And this is, uh, this is the, a product of the world in which we live. So although if you ask me what's my religion, I would say I was a Catholic. What was my way of life? How did I live my life? How did I behave every day? What were the things that I really thought were important? Because if you think about, if you think about this idea, what is a God? And I don't mean who is the creator. I mean, what is a God? What is a God? So Krishna... Ganesh, or any god that people worship, the ancient Greeks, or any god that people worship. Why do people worship these things? Why do they pray to them? Why do they sacrifice to them? Well, you know, the re normally I will interact with and ask you questions, but I will just, you know. So normally the reason is because people think, that people believe that this god, this thing, this idol, this whatever it may be, this saint, this whatever that they worship and they pray to, this thing will give them what they want and what they need. So now in some religions, you will find a different God for different things. So when you are going to war, you worship the God of war to get victory. When, you are, you know, when it is the harvest time, you worship the God of the crops to get a good harvest. When you want the rain to fall, you pray to, you pray to the rain God. Yes? 
So, and why do people do this? Because they think that this God will give them what they want and give them what they need. So this is the worship. If you think about this very deeply, think about it very deeply, then you will maybe begin to understand that whatever you think and whatever you believe is going to give you what you want and what you need. That is your God. What did the Prophet ﷺ mean when he said, Woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. What did he mean? Did he mean that people used to put a coin like that and pray to the dirham and the dinar? No, it doesn't mean that. It means the person who worships dinar and dirham is the one who thinks money is the source of their happiness and their success. They believe that money is going to get them what they need and what they want. They put their faith in money. They put their trust in money. They put their hope in money. When they have it, they are so happy. When they don't have it, they are so, had, so sad. It's as if this has become their God. So if you understand this, and you understand what is religion except the system through which you worship your God, then in reality, I would say, yes, I was a Catholic. But what was my religion in reality? My religion was the religion of most people. And that is worshipping the dunya. Most people, they worship the world and the things of the world. They believe the equation wealth equals happiness. That's what they, and that's what we are taught in the West. Wealth equals happiness. If you have money, you will be happy. This is what we are being indoctrinated with. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Money equals happiness. Wealth equals success. You should be wealthy. You should have this car. You should have this house. You should have these clothes. You should have this. If you have these things, you will be successful. You will be happy. This is the path to happiness. There was even a movie, I think, called In Pursuit of Happiness, all about some man who was very poor and he becomes very rich. Happiness, this is what they tell us, happiness is having money. So, this is really was my religion, to be honest, if I think about it. But then I was also questioning this. I started to see some things that made me really question this. The first thing was when my father went to work in Egypt. Now there I saw something very strange. Something very strange. Just as my mother saying, Mary, mother of God. <laughs> then in Egypt I saw something that contradicted everything I was being taught. So what did I see? I saw people who were very poor, but very happy. How, how was that? So, that's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to be poor and happy. You're supposed to be poor and miserable and rich and happy. But what was shocking to me was that some of the people I was seeing, their life was much more happy. And I could see it from them. Than what I could see in England. And this was very confusing to me. Very, very confusing. It didn't make any sense. It's contradicting everything I am being taught. It's very interesting that there was a, a uh, uh, in Hollywood, there was a filmmaker. He asked the same question. He was wondering why he's a producer in Hollywood. He said why nearly every single person he knew in Hollywood had very big problems. Mental problems, all sorts of problems, family problems, problems with the wife, problems with the children, so many problems. He said, I don't understand why. We all, the people in Hollywood have everything that we are told in society you're supposed to have. The nicest house, the nicest car, the money you can't imagine how much. So why are they so miserable? Why is their life so sad? Why is their life... Like that, he, did, he couldn't understand. So he decided to go on a journey to find out what is it that makes people happy and who are the happiest people in the world. Do you know who they found out had the highest rating of happiness of all people in the world? Do you know where they live? Can you guess? 
Huh? Okay, I can, it's a, but anyway, I, that they found out that the, pe, that the people living in the slums of Bombay or Calcutta, I don't remember, Bombay or Calcutta, they found that people living in the slums of Bombay or Calcutta, one of the two of them, had amongst the, or if not the highest happiness rating of anybody. It just doesn't make it, even to us sitting here, I'm sure everyone's thinking, no, 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 it can't be right. No, they wanted to know why. Well, the reason, the reason why they said they found out was because people there had very, very close, tight-knit communities. Although they didn't have a lot of money, everybody helped each other. They could leave their children to play in the street. No one was worried because everyone is looking after everybody. So these communities were very tight-knit, they were very close, they were very supportive of each other, even though they didn't have much, when there were problems, everybody helped each other, and people were very happy, even though they had very little. Even though by most of our standards, we think this is a miserable existence. So I was seeing something like this, honestly. I, was, I didn't make any sense to me, I was very confused. So this also gave me a lot of food for thought. So I began now to question, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? What is all of this for? What, why, why? I didn't really know why, what was my life for. I, I didn't believe anymore that it was, you know, Christianity had the answer. I didn't believe what I was being told, that wealth equals happiness. I, it didn't make sense to me. So, but, so why are we here? What's the purpose of life? Now, sisters and brothers, one of the, something I want to tell you. I don't think that new Muslims or convert Muslims are better than you know, people born into Islam. I don't believe that. People say, oh, new Muslims, they are better. New, no, I, I don't believe that's true. That's not true. Um, it's a mistake to think that. New Muslims can be just as bad or good or whatever as anybody else. But one thing a new Muslim has a convert to Islam has that someone from a Muslim background something you can never understand something you will never understand it completely the way a new Muslim does there's one thing okay and let if you think about a Muslim let's say this Muslim does so many haram things so all the bad things you can imagine everything Still, at the back of this Muslim's mind, this Muslim knows, you know what, I can come back to Allah, I can come back to Islam, you know, I will make Hajj one day when I'm 60, inshallah, Allah will, you know, but you know, yeah, because at the end of the day, this Muslim knows that there is something to, I know where's the, I know the right way, I know what's the Quran, I know it's Islam, I know where is salvation, you always know that. You always know where home is. One thing, someone from my situation, imagine you don't even know that. Imagine you are so lost and you are so confused. You have no idea even if there is such a thing as truth. You don't even really know if there is such a thing as guidance or not. I mean, you have nothing. You are lost in total darkness. You don't even know there's a way out. You're, it's, imagine this whole building, maybe you know this building, but imagine this whole compound here was suddenly thrown into complete darkness. Complete, so much, if you stretch your hand, you can't see. That's how dark it is. So imagine now, you have to leave the room. Imagine. Some of you will maybe go fast until you hit the pillar or you smash your head on the thing or you fall down the stairs. After that happens, you will start to go very slowly like this. Right? Huh? Yeah. And imagine that's your life. You're just going like this the whole way. You know everything. You're just... And you don't know, is there a way out? Imagine you want to get out. You don't even know if there is an out. You, maybe this is, you think this is your life. My whole life I'm going to have to go around like this. Maybe some people even feel that this is life and I'm, I'll, I'm happy going around like this. Yeah. They don't know there's anything. 
This is the situation of the person who does not know about the guidance from Allah. You know, so sisters and brothers, believe me, there are millions and millions and millions of human beings like this. They really, really need to know Islam. Even they don't know it themselves, but they are looking for the guidance. They are looking for the light. Even maybe they've become so used to living like this, they don't want to hear anything else. But deep inside themselves, they do. They need it. Their souls need it. Because Islam, Islam, what is Islam? People say, Abdurrahim, what is it like? You know, now, now that Allah guided you to Islam, do you feel any different? <laughs> yes, I feel different, really different. How different do you feel? Well, imagine you're dead and then you come to life. That's how different it is. Or like I say, imagine you're in this dark building, huge building, and then someone just turned on the lights and you could see. Or you just one day, you reached a thing, you pulled the handle and you opened the door and then you could see. You could see what's, you could see what's out there. So this is like Islam. This is like the situation before Islam and after Islam. So alhamdulillah, I started to look through different religions. I started to study, every, not every, but so many religions. I studied Buddhism. I followed Buddhism. I read different books. I read different things. I was really, really searching to find the truth. But after some years, I, I decided, I actually, after some years, I made my own, I even made up my own religion. I was, tell, I was telling someone this, the, uh, you know, like a few months ago. And he was going, oh, cool, man. You made your own religion. You know, I said, no, no, no. It wasn't cool. It was terrible. I said, it's the worst thing. The worst thing was my own religion. Because all I did is pick the bits and pieces that were nice. Right? Love, peace, oneness. You know, it was like that. You know, it sounds so good. I, even if I told you, you'd say, oh, that's a nice religion. You know? But did it do anything for me? Nothing. It was, it was the worst. You know? So then I gave up, actually. I said, no, maybe there is no, maybe I'm wasting my time. Why am I looking for answers? There are no answers. Maybe the truth is that wealth does equal happiness. I just didn't have enough money. That's the problem. I didn't have enough. So, and to give you an idea of how much wealth I think I needed to make me happy... I'm talking about, so this is the background I came from. In order to get more wealth, right, I, I'm thinking private jet, private island, you know, my own yacht. You know, that's the sort of level I needed to, yeah, maybe if I get there, I might find it. So I'm thinking, so this is, I start to think now. I'm start, because I studied history, I start to think, okay, now I want to be rich so I've decided I'm going to give up this search for religion and truth and what's the purpose of life. I should be rich. I need to be rich. That's the best thing. Let's go back to that. You know, maybe I just made a mistake about all of this. Wealth is happiness. So I just need lots of money. But I need lots of money without working hard. I don't want to work hard. Why? Because I want to enjoy life. I don't want to work. <laughs> you know, you want to do a little bit of work and get a lot of money. So I started to think, okay. How can I do a little work and get lots of money? Let me think about this. So I started thinking about all, you know, I started thinking, let me first think about history. The, let's think about the British. The British, they've got money. But, you know, that's, oh, the Industrial Revolution, and that's too much hard work. Americans, they've got money. The Americans have got money. Okay, that's, okay, the American dream is what? You start in the gutter, and you fight your way up, and, you know, I said, that's, what, that's too much hard work. The Japanese, they've got lots of money. No, all they do is work. They just work, work, work. They don't do anything else except work. No, 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 no. And then it came to me, oh my God, those Saudi Arabians. <laughs> They've been sitting on their camels going, Allahu Akbar. And they did nothing. What did they do? Nothing. And they've got all this money. I said, yeah, that sounds good. That's, you know, that sounds, that, uh, that's a good place to start. So I thought to myself, okay. I'm going to study these people. Let me study. Maybe they've got some secret ingredient, right? No work, lots of wealth. 
Okay, so I said, what's the secret ingredient? I said, okay, first of all, let me study their religion. What's their re and I'm not interested in religion now. I'm interested in money, all right? So I said, okay, what's their religion? Islam, Quran, I know that, okay? So I went to the bookshop in, in England, W.H. Smith's, yeah? And I took down the Penguin Classics series, Quran. Actually, the translation was done by an Iraqi Jew, <laughs> okay? And this translation, I took it down, uh, and this, I started to read it. Okay, I started to read this. Now, um, after spending 10 years in Egypt um, with pretty much no TV, because the TV was so terrible then, we didn't even bother watching it, I learned to read, and I learned to read fast. And this is not speed reading techniques, this is just reading, because you read a lot. So I could read a big book, a big book, you know, like, well, you wouldn't, you know, Harry Potter, but <laughs> that's big, like the last ones I, you know, that's, that, in terms of size, it's big, right? In terms of the words, I, I probably read that in two days, no problem, right? There's a book by Alex Haley called Roots. I read 90% of Roots in one night. Okay, I, I had finished another book that scared me so much I had to finish it. To just to take it out of my head, but you know, still I could read fast. Now the Quran, okay, as you can see, mashallah, it's not a very big book. In English, even the same. It's this, mashallah, this has borders and big writing. So imagine it's in English, yeah. It's it's even smaller. It's not. It's one hundred about one hundred thousand words. That's not a lot, in terms of the numbers of words. After two weeks of reading the Quran, I'm still reading it. Two weeks after I took the book down, I am still reading it. Day and night, I am reading it. And I haven't finished it. Because it's not like any other book that I read before. You know, and I wanted to understand. I'm not reading it just to, you know, read. I want to understand what is this book saying? What can I learn from this book? What, you know, what lessons do I have? So I'm reading it and reading it and trying to understand it. And, and I remember, you know, uh, I remember very well. I remember this very well. I was actually sitting on the train, uh, going to work, sitting there. Um, I'm going from Clapham, it doesn't matter, but from Clapham Junction, I'm going to Victoria. And this train goes over the Thames, and I'm looking out of the window, and I'm reading this book, and I look back, and I say to myself, I, put it, I close it, I say to myself, if I have ever read a book that is from God, this is it. So, alhamdulillah... I didn't know how to pray, I didn't know how to make wudu, but you know, there, there are some things in the Qur'an about washing yourself before prayer and bowing and standing and pro So I used to go home and just pray any way that I could. I just like made it up, you know, and washed and prayed and I didn't know. But after some time, alhamdulillah, I went to a masjid uh, and you know, I took shahada. And I would say that actually this was a, a beginning of another journey. It's a beginning of another journey. Uh, my journey within Islam, which is actually a whole nother story, but you know, inshallah, we can leave that for another time. So, uh, sisters and brothers, you know, Jazakallah khair for listening to me. I hope that, alhamdulillah, you got some benefit from this story. Especially, please, you know, think about the messages that are coming to you from the world outside. You know, we, you're getting the same message that I was getting. You know, wealth equals happiness. I'm not saying you should be poor, I'm not saying you should be uneducated. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, if we don't have money, how would we build, you know, this amazing institution? I'm not saying that. But don't think it's going to make you happy. Don't think money will make you happy. It will not make you happy. You can have it in your hand, but don't have it in your heart. This is how we should be. You know, really in reality, wallahi, sisters and brothers, happiness comes from knowing Allah, from loving Allah, from, a, from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where the hearts truly find rest. This is truly where happiness comes. This is truly the meaning of la ilaha illallah. May Allah bless you. May Allah help you in your studies. May Allah increase you and this a beautiful, amazing institute in goodness. And all of those who learn here, all of those who teach here, 
for the founders of this amazing place, alhamdulillah, you know, I feel so proud and happy to be here and to see what's happening. And you're part of something truly amazing. Don't forget that, sisters and brothers. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.